couple of messages. There'll be no iron men or iron women tomorrow. This is a holiday. And um, the youth are gone to Gatlinburg for the youth conference. And uh, Brother Eddie has touched base with Pastor Greg and has shared that there's been several decisions made at the youth conferences for Christ. So let's keep them in our prayers, and they will be coming back this evening. Um, so as they travel, just keep them in their prayers, and they were finishing up today. So uh, Awana will start when? Two weeks? On the 10th of January after school starts back. So um, I don't think there's any more announcements, but uh, let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our service. God, we, uh, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for this opportunity to gather as, as children of yours, um, connected by your son's blood. Father, in this house to worship and to call upon your name. And God, I just pray that we glorify you, uh, that we lift you up, that we lift Jesus up. And God, that your spirit would just move within our hearts and that we would draw close to you and that we would hear from you and learn of you. And God, that we would be more like Christ. And God, if there's burdens that we need to lay down that you bring to our attention, God, I pray that you give us the strength to do that and be with those that are traveling, uh, the youth as they're at their conference and as they're going to be traveling this evening. Lord, that you would be with them, protect them, keep them safe. And Lord, we give you all the glory and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He had given me a new song to sing a hymn of praise to our God. Psalms 41 through 3. Please stand and worship with us.
Thank you, girls. That was great. I'm so proud of them. They've been so excited to sing with us, and it's just been great to have them join us. But now we're going to sing Shout to the Lord. Be seated if you want to. Beyond all hope, you won't let go. 
Thank you, girls. Um, Do you notice we don't have a hymn book? Our screen. And um, it's still out. And I, it got me to thinking, boy, oh, Greg, these songs that you love and you sing, you really need to be singing them often to to know the truth of its word, the words of the songs. Um, because the, what went through my mind is what would we do if we didn't have electricity or if we didn't have projection systems and all the things that we have. So that's just me and that's just a preacher thing. That uh, uh, These songs really need to be hidden in our hearts. And um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, hide those songs in your heart because... Uh, they can come up in the in a, during a time of need, particularly, and you may not have a projection system or even a hymn book in front of you. But if they're in your heart, boy, oh, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful reality that God has given us that we can memorize and learn Scripture as well as uh, words of songs. I want to invite your attention to Matthew chapter 24. Our children may be dismissed to children's church. And uh, I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope you had a, a wonderful time with family. Um, hope you enjoyed your time celebrating Christ. I hope that, uh, hope that His presence filled your house and your home and your hearts in every single way. And for those of you who are visiting with us today, some of you from far away places because you're visiting uh, family, and uh, we're glad that, that you're with us today um, as well. We have been looking at um, Matthew chapter 24 particularly, but we've been looking at this idea of eventful days, adventful days, meaning advent means the coming. And today I want to I want to take us to Matthew chapter 24 because Every generation has this question. And you have this question, and, and the disciples had this question. Uh, every generation asks this question. And the question that, that is posed is, was posed by his disciples. 
And they were, they were coming from the temple, and Jesus made a prophecy that was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Concerning, concerning the building of the temple and the destruction of the temple. And it would be fulfilled in just 30-some years prior to that with the invasion of Rome. And literally, the foundations of the temple, the rocks, the, the large stones were upturned. And Jesus told them about that. Well, it prompted a question. It prompted the question, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, he says, the disciples, tell, tell us when these things will be. And then they asked the question, what will be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age. Now, every generation has wondered that. And you wonder that, and I wonder that. Matter of fact, according to a recent survey, 40% of people believe that we are living in the end times. Do you? 40% of Americans believe that we're living in the end times. And Jesus talks about it. He talks about the time of His coming, His second coming, but there will be a time that will precede that. And the time prior to His second coming will be the calling out of the church, the calling away of the church to Christ. And after that, according to biblical chronology, will be, will be a time of great tribulation on the earth unlike human history as ever known. And Jesus talks about that, that there will be that time that will come upon the earth that will precede His second coming. Jesus gives a spiritual application for all of us, for any generation, any time, at any point in human history, and that we are to be watchful. That no one knows the day or the hour of the coming of Christ. But Jesus gives us some ideas as to the seasons of the time. What it looks like. And so we have looked at some of those things from the scripture as it relates to Christ and his second coming. If you just do a casual observation of the book of Genesis, and really not too far into it, just the first three chapters. I did so over, over this Christmas break. What do you do during, during break? Well, I study the Bible. Because I love studying the Scripture. And one of the things that I discovered just in a casual reading of the first three chapters of the book of Genesis is that we get, the, we get introduced to the Creator. His name is Elohim, God. And we find that He's a God who is powerful, who creates by His spoken word, and He creates out of nothing. He speaks things into existence. And they are. They materialize and become the reality that you and I experience. We see it. And we find that this God is the creative God who not only creates, He creates the pinnacle of His creation is human beings. He created Adam from the dust of the earth that, that He spoke into existence. He created Adam. And Adam became a living soul. He took Eve from, the, from Adam's side. He put him into a, to a deep sleep. And man has been into a deep sleep ever since. Hasn't he? My wife thinks so sometimes. But um, Eve was created. They had a perfect place, a perfect garden. There was innocence and there was a pure, undefiled relationship with their Creator. It was a glorious place. And God and, and Adam and Eve, they enjoyed the fellowship with God in the cool of the day in that garden. 
in that garden they had a purpose in life they had an identity and their identity was wrapped up in them being created in the image of God and God we which we understand a little more about God God said let us make man in our image meaning that God is coming from a place of community and that there is unity in in the community of the Trinity and heaven, that is the reality of heaven. And they enjoyed that and they experienced that on earth. We also understand from just a casual observation of Genesis, we also, of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, that there was the existence of evil in the world, in the embodiment of a serpent named Satan. And you find that this serpent was in, a, was in rebellion with, the, with his own creator. He was just an angel. Some suppose that he was the worship leader of heaven. But he had fallen. And he, was in fall, he had fallen because his, his, great, his, his great deception was that he was self-deceived. I want to be like God. And he became in rebellion. And the scripture says in other places that there was one third of the heavenly host that had fallen. Fallen angels. Satan tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. One, one stipulation, so we see that there is God, we see that God created man, we see the existence of evil in the world, and that God was in a covenant relationship that, that, that gave them choice. And the choice was is that they could serve God and serve, serve Him in all the fullness of His glory and enjoy that uninterrupted, unadulterated fellowship with Him. And they did. They had one stipulation. They could eat of any tree of the garden. With the exception of one. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we find that he's the covenant making God. And a covenant implies relationship. Get that. So we get... One, we get the idea then that there is a God. We get the idea that there is man. We get the idea that they were in a perfect place and that He is the God who creates a covenant and, we, and that he is, the, he is also in that reality was the existence of Satan. The evil one, the ultimate evil. evil. Nobody names their son or daughter Satan, do they? They don't even name their dog that. Why, it was the embodiment of all evil. Of everything, of everything wicked and everything opposed to God was Satan. And there we get it. If you wonder why there's evil and suffering in the world, just no, hang on just a second. Yes, it's the existence of, of, of evil and Satan. But humans have choice. Adam and Eve had a choice and they chose, they chose to follow in the rebellion of Satan. And there was a fall. And from that fall, we find, in, with just a casual reading of those three chapters, another theme unfolds. What unfolds in that is the reality of God in His grace and His mercy to bring salvation and atonement. God is reaching for them. God always does. God was reaching for Adam and Eve in the garden. They were hiding in their shame, in their nakedness, in their guilt, in their fear, in their conflict, in their disease, and in the dissonance in their soul. And yet God was reaching. God asked Adam the question that has run throughout the ages of time. Adam, where are you? God is asking the same question for you today. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you as in relationship to your relationship with your Creator? Where are you? Where are you with the existence of evil in the world? Do you live for I 
or you live for God. Real simple. Every other ism that our world lives by today usually follows from the isms of human wisdom. No matter what they are. The question arises, where are you, Adam? Where are you? And we find that God clothed Adam and Eve in the garden. There was a sacrifice that he made on their behalf. And then in chapter 3, we get a promise which would, would turn out to be like a prophecy. That, that the world, if you ever look at why there's evil and suffering in, in the existence of the world, then you find it in the curse. They were expelled from the garden. Thorns and thistles would be their lot. They would deal with the moral consequences of moral choices. Which means then, being created in the likeness and the image of God, they understood He was a moral creator. And He was the God who would reach out in love and mercy and call them into salvation in their fallenness. And yet, they would experience the heartache and the hardship of moral choices. Judgment was an issue. In the garden. And salvation is the answer. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, you find that the world was wicked. There was a pervasive darkness over the world after the murder of Cain, uh, killing his brother Abel. There was a proliferation of every kind of evil and darkness imaginable to man. So much to the point that it grieved God that He even created man. Man was designed to express the glory and to reflect the glory of this Creator. Man had so fallen and their posterity had so fallen into wickedness and to sin and to evil and to perversion of every kind. Why? Because they were following the ways of the rebellious one, Satan. Wickedness of all sorts, of every imaginable and unimaginable kind, permeated Noah and his day. And Jesus said, just before he comes, it will be like a day like Noah's. He said it would be that way. He said before he would come, in verse 36 of chapter 24, but that day, no one knows the hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as it was, or as, it, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus said, if you want to know when the hour that I'm coming is, it will be like it was in Noah's day. And then he goes on to elaborate. For those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What is he saying there? Is he saying that uh, because they were marrying? And No. But what he is saying is, is it was going, it, life was going on just like normal. In other words, 
in a time of darkness, it is easy to become used to being in the dark. Have you ever noticed that? If you go out to eat at one of these nice dimly lit restaurants that is romantic, you sit there, you sit down there, and by the, t- by the time when you walk in, you look and you can't even see, you can't even see your spouse. You say, is that you over there? And then they bring, you the, they bring your, your menu to you, and your eyes are, are adjusting a little more. And, and, and all of a sudden you say, well, I, let me see, can you make that out, what's on the menu? You, bring, you take out your phone. Aren't you glad for flashlights on phones now? Somebody talk to me. Yeah, I, I am. Um, so, you, you know, you pull the flashlight out and, and you say, well, you know, here, here, here and, and of course, then you realize that you've got another problem because you don't understand the menu. You yeah? know? But all of a sudden, you begin to think, oh, I can begin to make out some words. Why? You, you begin to become used to the dark. It's easy, isn't it? We become desensitized to it. We become the frog in the kettle. And the kettle is becoming warmer and warmer and hotter and hotter. You know, it's said that in 2004, on the shoreline of Sri Lanka, some horrifying thing happened. No one was aware of it. They were caught off guard and unaware to this massive tsunami that was on its way. It was caused in just a few minutes. It happened in just a few minutes. It was unimaginable. Close to 40,000 people's lives were lost. Which had a lot of people saying, is there ways that we can know when these things are coming? It's interesting, National Geographic did an article on this. And they said that, you know, people around were oblivious, but the animal kingdom, they weren't. There were animals that were going to higher ground. They were preparing. They were preparing because they knew something was coming. Are you... So Jesus, Jesus talks about that he would come as it, and it, and it would be in a time that it was like the days of Noah. That will be the time that he said there will be. Now, we get the issue of judgment. The Bible says that there is an appointed unto man once to die, and after this he will stand before the one who has rightful claim over him. His creator. Created in his image. Created in his glory. And it's appointed once to man to die, and then after this, the judgment. The judgment. The reality of life and it's an appointment on God's calendar. Now we don't like to think of it. Matter of fact, in our, in our modern church kind of age, it's not popular because this was the real message if you lived back in the 70s. This is about all I heard. And now we scantily even hear about the message. But it's a biblical message, and it's the biblical concept of judgment. Well, we find it in Genesis chapter 3. You find it again in Genesis chapter 6. And if you look at Genesis chapter 6, you will find that wickedness covered the land. Matter of fact, it was so bad that it was, it was almost unlivable. There was, there, was, there was such wickedness and perversion in the land that, that, um, that there was such a violence and disregard for what was created in the image of God. And God, God called uh, one man 
by the name of Noah. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the sight of God. Now, it wasn't because Noah was some sort of great saint, perhaps, or, but he, he loved God. And God called Noah to do an unlikely task in an unlikely day in an uncommon time. He called him to build an ark. And on that ark would, house, would, would be the, the housing of all kinds of, of animals, of, of species that would come on that ark. Noah was a minister of righteousness in an uncommon time, in an uncommon day. He had been given the grace of God. And I can say that there was no doubt that, that Noah, as he, was, as he was building the ark, was sharing the message of God and hope and mercy and their safety. And his message was, is that there is a coming judgment, and it's going to be a judgment that will be rain. It will cover the whole earth. And you say, you know, it's interesting as you read Genesis chapter 6 here, the biblical account, it's, it's interesting that you find it, it's found in other, other literature as well. Why? Because it was a worldwide event. And no one escaped. Noah was building the ark faithfully. 120 perhaps years. They would say, How is that? that is that crazy old man Noah. He's out building the ark and he's, he's crying out for a generation to turn to God. A generation to turn to God and to flee the coming judgment. That was the message. Is that, is that you have been creating the image of God... God has a purpose and plan for your life, but He is also a God who will call you and me into account of that. That was His message. It was a call to repentance and faith and to trust in the covenant-making God who brings salvation. And the ark was a symbol of mercy. It was a symbol of God's grace. It was a symbol of God's protection. It was a symbol of hope in, a, in the midst of a wicked and perverse world. That judgment is coming, but there is mercy and grace, and there is an ark that is being built. And what is interesting is the only people that were saved during this time was Noah and his family. But thank God for Noah and his family. You see, one of the things that had happened perhaps in Noah's days, and you can read all about this, was, was that there is this pervasive wickedness. There was a, there, there, it was a demonized con culture. That's all you can say about it. There was an intermingling of, of fallen angels with men, and I, I don't know to what extent or how that goes. But it was so bad and so perverse that God said, they will be no more. This will not go on. And judgment came. And what, what amazes me is the animal kingdom had enough sense to get in the ark. They knew, intuitively, they knew their Creator. I'm thinking that in a time that, or like the days of Noah, we need some people like Noah. Some of you may be the only person that has a connection with God in your family. You may be the only missionary, the only one who is called. And if God has called you and you have been saved by grace, then you have a commission of grace to go and to share the calling of Christ. To share that gospel. 
That cost will, may not be understood, it may be misunderstood, it may be maligned, and it may even be scoffed at it, but you share it. Because in a world that goes darker and darker and deeper in darkness, the light will shine brighter and the light of grace and mercy can penetrate through the hopelessness and the despair. It's time to pray for our children. Our grandchildren. It's time, it's time to share the gospel and to be a missionary. You see, if, if, if Noah would have been in church today, it would have been him and his family, maybe. And Noah would say, well, I'm the missionary to my generation. It, it, was, not a, it was not an easy street kind of mission. It wasn't like the TV preaching that you see today. The lights, the camera, the action. No, it was just down in the nitty gritty of life stuff. And Noah was there. And Noah was, the, and Noah was the connection with God to his world and to his community. And they knew Noah was a man of righteousness. And I'm thinking that the man who had been touched with grace, who knew grace, who lived that grace out, and who called people to live in God's favor. We have a commission. You have a message. If you have been saved by the grace of God, you have a message. And that message is to share the message of hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection to a world that has lost its way. Don't get mad at the world. Listen, the darkness is dark. But you are not called to darkness, you are called to light. You are called to hope. You are called to grace. You are called to mercy. You are called to be an extension of God's grace in a wayward world. And the message is, is as surely as God is on His throne, and I believe is as surely as you are standing here on this earth, and as surely you are in this reality. There is a consummation of human history that is coming. And the consummation of human history is this, is that the glorious judge will be revealed. And before Him will stand the small and the great, every man and woman who has ever walked the face of this earth. There will be a judgment, there will be a judgment before, before, of the small and the great before this great and mighty judge. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord and glory. The demons already know it. And they know their doom. Are you living in the light of the coming judge? You say, Well, I'm Christian. I am too. But don't you know that we as Christians will face judgment? Now, it's not going to be the judgment like the world faces. Judgment that you and I will face will be the judgment of what we do and how we live our lives here and now. It's not a judgment whether you get into heaven or not. No. It's a judgment of rewards. It's a judgment of rewards. It's called the Bema judgment. You can find it in 1 Corinthians. But then there's another judgment. By the time you get to Revelation chapter 19, and, and 19 I believe, and tw or 20, right around there, 19, there's a great white throne judgment. People standing before the, the small and great before the Lord. You see, Noah found grace. Noah was a man of integrity. He had a devoted heart to God. He walked in grace. And you know something? You say, well, where is God's love in all of this, Greg? I, I, find, it, I find it to be a, an, 
a difficult, a difficult reality to uh, paradox to resolve in my mind at how such a loving God can bring judgment. I get it. I've, 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 I've wrangled with the question over and over and over and over and over and over and over in my mind. But this loving God loves righteousness. There's not one of us here that, look, that can look out in the world today, or you can look on human history, and you can say, and you could say, I don't understand why that God allowed that. Or I can't believe they did that thing. I can't believe that, that evil on this level could exist. Well, hang on. The judge is on the way. The judge is on the way. And he is perfect in love. He's perfect in righteousness. He is perfect in holiness. He is perfect in grace and love and mercy. And the message, the message today is, man, there is an ark. There is an ark of safety. There is an ark of security. There is an ark where you can know that you know that you know. In other words, you know the judge. And the judge is not only the one who stands in righteousness and holiness and who, and who even gives us the intuitive sense that things are not right. Is the same judge who steps down from the majesty and he comes down as our defense attorney and says, Yes, Lord, but I have bought them and I've paid the price for them. Do you know a judge like that? Do you know a judge that is so perfect in love that he would step down to where you are and where I'm at? And even though he was created in the likeness, of, he was, he was, there was no sin in him. He was only created in the likeness of sinful man. He was God coming to where we are. Religion's trying to figure it all out and get to God. And God says, they can't figure it out. I'm coming to them. Why? Because I'm holiness and I'm righteousness, but they are created in my image and they're fallen. They're in darkness and they're pilfering in the darkness and in hopelessness. And his message is a message of hope and His message is a message of light. His message is a message that can call you from darkness to light. And it can call you to where uh, that you have a firm footing to stand on that when you stand before your Maker on that day, you can say, here I am, Lord, by the grace of God and through and by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross and your sacrifice is sufficient. Are you trusting in Him? And I'm talking about, are you trusting, are you banking your eternity on Jesus? Because as sure as we're sitting here and as sure as I'm standing here today, there is a certain judgment that will come. And we don't know the day or the hour. We're to be called salt and light. There was a time when the rain began God closed the ark door. Forty days. Rain. Time of great devastation. Matter of fact, it's interesting. I used to work at a rock quarry of all places. At least I interacted with people who worked in the rock quarries. 
Some of them would tell me they'd get into rock stratas and they'd say, you know, we found seashells. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Yeah. Hmm, go figure. How'd they get there? Good question. You see, it's even in the stratas of our earth. The witness of God. The witness of God. And what you find in, in Genesis chapter 7... Verse 17, now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased, now the waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. Judgment had come. And the only safe place on the planet was this boat that Noah built. That was it. I'm reminded of a New Testament verse. Jesus, people had always wondered and questioned about who this man from Nazareth was. Nazareth was not a popular place. You wouldn't expect anybody with any notoriety or even religious. To come from Nazareth. But there was Jesus. Her voice come from heaven. Uh, they didn't take those voices lightly, by the way. They knew their Bible. God is the God who speaks. He spoke over Christ at baptism. Jesus predicts His death. He says, now my soul is troubled and but for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name, Jesus said. Therefore the people who stood by heard it. And it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken. Jesus answered them and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. And now the ruler of this world will be cast out no more let sin and sorrow grow and one day there will be a no more let thins or uh, thistles and thorns grow And then Jesus said these words. And if I be lifted up from the earth, he was suspended between heaven and the earth on a cross. He said, I will draw all peoples to myself. An ark of safety. An old rugged cross lifted up. Lifted up for everyone, for whosoever will. The God man who endured the payment and the penalty for my sin. was lifted up as a satisfactory offering all sufficient to the Heavenly Father. And from that cross flows a mercy and a grace that says 
you don't have to face a certain judgment without your God. And from that mercy and grace was righteousness that flows down in the heart of everyone who says, Yes, Lord, I receive. Your mercy and grace. Yes, Lord. The inclinations of my heart say that there is a moral world and a moral Creator. And yes, Lord, I turn from what breaks Your heart to the One that You love. For God so loved the world that He gave his one and his only son who would be lifted up between suspended between heaven and the earth and his blood would drip the breath of life would be breathed out The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Do you know Him? Do you? I can't think of any better thing to end out 2023 than knowing that you can enter 2024 knowing the God who created you. You see, you need more than in life than just direction. Direction's good. You need more in life than to feel good about yourself, even though that's important. You, you need more in life than a better job or a better standing or a better whatever. You need God. You need Him. And He's created us to know Him. I want you to bow with me. Girls, come on back up. I hope you know Him. Now I've tried to be as faithful as I can in sharing you the message, not only of the Gospel, but the whole theme of Scripture. That there is a God. God created human beings. Man has fallen into sin. God provides a way of salvation through Christ. And judgment is coming. That you don't have to follow the way of rebellion. That kind of says, oh, God loves, so I can live any way that I want to live. That's not the biblical doctrine of love. God loves you, and God loves righteousness. And the Holy Spirit convicts our heart when things aren't right. What could happen in your life? You say, man, 2023, Greg. Well, I'm just trying to figure it out. Trust your God. And know for a certain that you're in relationship with Him. That it's not one based on you trying to be a good person. Or you trying to be a better person. Or you resolving to be a better Christian. Or do you know Him? You settle that one. That's the first foundation to settle. You settle that one. 
And then you, you go to the second step and you begin to say, okay, God, then I want to live in obedience to your righteous. I want to live for you. And I want, I, want, I want to be a vessel, an instrument like Noah was in his day. I want to be an instrument of, of grace to my family. I want to be an instrument of grace to people that, not, that I only care about, to people that don't know you, that are living in darkness. I'm tired of shaking my head at the darkness. I'm going to take the message to my neighbors. I'm going to be a missionary that steps out with the gospel of grace. You see, we're living in a time that we need some people like Noah that will, say, that, that will do as Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I. Let's stand together and let's pray together. If there's needs in your heart, maybe you want to pray in the new year then right here would be a great place to do it. Maybe you don't know Him and you've, you're not sure about your salvation. You can know. You can come forward today. Somebody will explain to you. Or if you don't want to come forward today, I'm here. Ryan's here. Um, Pastor Jeff's here. Ed's here. We'll talk. We can hear. Know that Christ and His grace is reaching. And it is. And thank God that it is. And Lord, I simply ask that you do with this message what pleases you. For it's your name we pray. And for your glory we pray. And all God's people say, Amen.
bless you. Lord, keep you. Shine upon you. The Lord give you peace. Until that day. Until that glorious day. When the Prince of Peace shall reign upon his throne. Amen. Go in peace.